Hi, this is Dan Mailer. Welcome to another episode of London Lights. Now today we're going to change gears a little bit. We're not talking music or entertainment or acting. We're talking politics. But don't change the dial. Hang with us. You're going to hear a fascinating story about one of London's greatest lights, Premier John Robarts. And I'm very pleased today to have as my guest, the one and only Steve Pakin. Steve, welcome to the program. So nice to be with you. Thanks for asking. I really appreciate the chance to talk about a man that I think not enough Ontarians know about, and they should know about because he was very important and influential in the history of our province. Before we start the interview, I just wanted to mention you're not only a popular TVO host of the program called The Agenda, but you're also an author. And I've got three books that uh, you've written. Aha. Uh -huh. The Life. The I remember that one. Fall of Politics. <laughs> Uh, then a more ominous one called The Dark Side. A little bit scary looking, but I'll sure you explain that in a moment. And then, of course, the book that brought us together today, uh, Steve Pakin's book on public triumph, private tragedy, the double life of John Robarts. Nice picture of him, eh? I love that shot. Yeah, I, I really do as well. And, uh, you know, they're fast. All of these stories are fascinating. And uh, when I attended high school and studied history, a lot of my friends said, oh, man, history, Canadian history is the most boring subject that we could be taking. But what is it about politics? What is it about history that you find so attractive and compelling that you write books about it? Well, with all due respect to your friends, I couldn't disagree more with them. I don't think there's anything boring about it. I think it's the stuff of um, it's the stuff of drama. It's the stuff of excitement. It's the stuff of camaraderie. Uh, it's the stuff of of in some cases win at all costs and elbows up and and um, you know trying to conquer your opponents and and at the same time trying to work with uh, adversaries and friends to get things done. Uh, there's there's just a lot there. A lot of the sort of big themes of life that that have just always fascinated me and the people and the personalities that make up that, that pond uh, have just always been of interest to me. And when we look at Ontario, of course, uh, we're kind of the model in many ways of how politics should be run. Yeah, the elbows come up, but we're not super partisan for the most part. And look at the end result. Uh, Ontario has been a fantastic place to live for many decades now. And that doesn't happen by accident. I think that's a tribute to some of our leaders. Yeah, I, I would say it's less true today than it was back in the day. Uh, certainly in the days of John Robarts and Bill Davis leading the province of Ontario, it was a less toxically partisan place. John Robarts, I can remember when, um, you know, when MPPs first got elected, when he was Premier of Ontario, uh, he used to put everybody, they go down to Union Station, they put all the MPPs, all, I think 120 or 125 of them would get on the train together and they'd go up to Northern Ontario and they'd spend uh, a week just up, a, up the train, going to the north, traveling to the north. It, it did a couple of things. It gave people a greater understanding of, of the vastness of this province. A lot of people think when you get to the French River, uh, you know, then you're in northern Ontario. Uh, I, I, I can tell you, you know, Sudbury may be four hours north of here, but there's a lot of Ontario north of Sudbury. So that's one of the things that they found out. And the other thing was, you know, it's really hard to practice the politics of personal destruction uh, when you've been on a train with somebody for a week and they've shown you pictures of their kids and grandkids and you talk about their families. And it just was a little, it was a lot more collegial back then. It's a lot less so today, but certainly the time that we're talking about, it definitely was more so. And I know for that Robarts book that I wrote, I had people in the Liberal and New Democratic parties uh, praising him for the kind of leader that he was. Uh, if I'm not going on too long here, Dan, I got another fast story for you, which is, you know, when, when opposition members, uh, it's, it's often been the case that when opposition members go to civil servants to get information, governments that are a little more partisan in their stripes than the Robarts government would say things like, well, we're not really supposed to help you. Robarts put an edict out to the public service in his day that honorable members are elected on all sides of the house to do the public's business. And, and you are to help liberal opposition and new Democratic Party opposition members if they need help or information from you to do their jobs. Because the better they are in opposition, the better we'll be in government. I mean, that's a pretty rare approach 
for a premier of Ontario to take, and it speaks very well of him, I think. I agree, uh, and that's a, a fantastic standard to set for the, the government and the civil service. But everyone great has to start somewhere. And John <laughs> Robards started in our hometown. That's why we're called this show London Lights. Uh, John Robards started in London, Ontario. His roots are here. What do you know about his time in London? What can you tell us about it? And how was it important in the kind of man he became? I guess his, his formative year started in London, but he's actually the only premier in Ontario history who's not born in Ontario. He's actually born in Banff, Alberta. His life started in Alberta. And eventually uh, his father made his way uh, to the province of Ontario and um, got the job in London and uh, I, I believe came up in banking. And so um, Mr. Robarts had, um, I, I think, by all accounts, a pretty upper middle class background, uh, you know, raised in London. Uh, his first attempt at politics was for London City Council. And if you can imagine this, he won his first London City Council race by seven votes. And it often makes me wonder, you know, if four people in that election had voted a different way and he lost, you know, there's people who run and lose and decide never to run again. Right. Um, who knows how history might have been different if, he, if four people had gone in another direction and voted for another candidate. Wow. Uh, but they didn't, and so he won. Yeah. And uh, he didn't spend much time on London Council. I think he got elected in 1950. Uh, he'd already been a lawyer. Uh, and therefore, uh, he only hung around, I think, London municipal politics for a year and then went up to provincial politics right away and won three straight elections for Leslie Frost in 51, 55, and 59. And there's another interesting story about that middle election, Dan, which is that in 55, who was the candidate for the Liberal Party against John Robarts in that election? David Peterson's father, Clarence Peterson, another you know, very prominent London family uh, in politics. And that was Robarts' toughest race. And he always used to say, my toughest race in, was in 55 against Clarence Peterson. And the reason it was the toughest race is because he was the finest candidate I ever ran against. Again, there's a guy who's magnanimous. He's able to be nonpartisan. He's able to see good in other people. Very fine qualities, I'd say. Yeah, that speaks volumes about the kind of character that he had. And uh, it was interesting that you mentioned about the fact he was a lawyer uh, my understanding, doing some research, I spoke to lawyer David Nash in London. He was saying that uh, for the most part, when you sat in the legislature of Ontario, you sat maybe four months of the year and uh, it didn't pay very well. So you <laughs> almost had to have a second gig. And uh, John Robarts was in a law firm with uh, Jeffrey Flynn, who went on to become a, a judge. I think Peter Betts, who had a cottage in Bancroft where they'd go hunting from time to time. Hmm. Um, he was involved uh, as a lawyer, got his training there, and I assume that that transposed itself or translated into his political career and assisted him. Yeah, I think so. And in fact, back in the day, there were a lot more lawyers in public life than there are today. Today, I, I'd say thankfully, uh, we have a, a much broader range of experiences in our provincial legislatures and House of Commons. Uh, there are people from many different backgrounds. But back then, yeah, if, if, uh, a lot of people went into law for the purposes of taking that law degree and doing something else with it. I don't think John Robarts, uh, you know, had plans to be a lifelong lawyer. It seemed pretty obvious. Well, here, this is a bit of a cute story, but I think it actually reflects a bigger point. He was born on January the 11th. Johnny McDonald was born on January the 11th. Jean Chrétien was born on January the 11th. There's something about being born on January the 11th and having the name John that means you're about to become a first minister somewhere in the country. <laughs> so I had a feeling that uh, given that birthday and given that first name, uh, something else was out there waiting for him besides right. the law. And he very quickly figured out that that was politics. You know, he was, in, he was involved in an organization when he went to university, something called ADSEPA, which was an acronym, A-D-S-E-P-A. And oh, for the life of me, I can't remember what it stands for today. Something like, the, you know, it was a group of students who just created this ad hoc group and it was something like uh, association for the discussion of social, uh, economic, and political activities or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed pretty clear from a very young age uh, that he had bigger plans than simply practicing law. And he also managed to figure out, Dan, that one of the things that he was really good at 
was that he could go out and party like a son of a gun till all hours of the morning, go home and get a, you know, just a few hours of sleep and then be up bright and early, bushy tailed, ready to go the next day. That's how he was as a university student. And that's how he was as a premier of Ontario as well. He partied hardy, he lived hard, but he always managed to get the job done. The other thing that's different about politics from what I understand back in those days is although it was a democracy, there was a lot of backroom uh, politics going on. And there's a famous historic story in London about Jenkins Feed Store. Oh, yes. <laughs> there was a, it was a male-dominated uh, backroom uh, uh, political uh, powerhouse that was involved in the city. And when an opening came up for the Ontario legislature, the boys got together uh, in Jenkins Feed Store, I think on the second floor, talk politics and they said okay we've got an opening let's uh, let's find a way to make this happen for london and put a successful candidate in and of course that was john robarts is that your understanding as well not only that i think it went well beyond that now you, you got to remember these are the days where if there was an opening at the uh, local lcbo you know th th this was not uh, sort of a neutral hands off employ employment uh, situation uh, you know, the folks in the political back rooms decided, well, you know, so-and-so's cousin needs a job. Let's stick him in that LCBO corner store or whatever. Yeah, that's how they did things back then. And uh, yeah, I think I refer to that in the book, the Jenkins, Ernie Jackson and John Robarts and the gang meeting in, at uh, the feed store. And, you know, Ernie Jackson was basically the guy who ran the political wing of the PC party for Mr. Robarts. He was from Tilsonburg. They were, you know, great buddies. I think Mr. Jackson ended up being an MPP for just one term. And then I think he realized that with Robarts and he both running in that part of the province, they both weren't going to end up in cabinet. And John was obviously the rising star. So Ernie decided to go do something else. And something else was basically run the political wing of the PC party for Mr. Robarts, uh, which he did, um, you know, very well just up until about the end. I think both men lost interest uh, as the uh, Robarts premiership lasted. Uh, but uh, they were a pretty dynamic duo for a good long time. And what is it do you think they saw in Robarts that they thought would make a good candidate? Obviously, he was a good-looking fellow. I understand he was well-spoken. He had charisma. Uh, he just looked like he fit the part. Would you agree? Uh, no question. Before I wrote the book on John Robarts, I did a documentary for TVO about him. And we, had, you know, TVO, the Robarts government set up TVO. Bill Davis was the education minister uh, who ended up creating TVO. And so we have lots of footage of John Robarts from his political days in the basement at TVO. And as I was putting the documentary together, his daughter, Robin, lived not too far away from TVO. And I knew her a little bit. So I called her up one day and I said, could you come to the station and come into a screening room with me and look at some of this old footage? Because I don't know who these people are and I suspect you will. So Robin is about 40 years old at this point. I think her father's been dead for probably 15 years or something. And she comes into the screening room and I push play and on come these very old, you know, archive footage of her father from back in the day. And the first thing she does is she says, whoa, boy, was he ever good looking? No <laughs> wonder the women loved him so much. So it was just another indication to me of, of, you know, how this guy looked like he was in some respects right out of central casting. You know, he was a tall, good looking guy with a deep gravelly voice. He conveyed the impression of a guy in charge. His nickname was the chairman of the board uh, because he was that sort of steady hand on the tiller that Ontarians appreciated while he was premier from 61 to 71. Well, it sounds like all the stars are lining up for him to grab the political ring of power in, a, in Toronto by the sounds of it, Steve. We're going to take a quick break. So hang with us, viewers. We'll be back right after this break with Steve Pakin talking about Premier John Robarts. Okay, Steve, so before the break, we were talking about John Robart's days in London, Ontario. Very impressive guy. He's chosen to uh, run in uh, London, Ontario uh, to, to obtain a seat in the legislature, and he's successful. He goes to Toronto. Uh, how do they receive him in Toronto initially? It's funny, he, you know, given that people had their eye on him as a rising star in the party, he didn't immediately make it into cabinet. He sat on the back benches for quite a long time. And I think at one point he went to Eddie Goodman, who was sort of a, a backroom guy for Premier Leslie Frost. And he said, look, if I don't get in, I'm out. 
And <laughs> Mr. Goodman took that information to Leslie Frost. And what do you know, uh, John Robarts went from backbencher to minister of education, which was like being minister of health today. Education back then had all the money. So he got the job as the minister of education, which set him up beautifully for his run for the leadership in 1961, gave him a, a tremendous amount of profile. And uh, obviously, as you know, um, it worked, and he did become the next leader of the party. Now, Steve, do you think that this was a result of the powers that be looking at Robarts and saying he could be the man? Or was there some something driving John Robarts to want to get to the top? Oh, I wouldn't say either or. I would say both and. Uh, there were people who had their eye on him, and he clearly was a guy uh, on a mission who, when he ran for the leadership in 61, said, look, I'm, I'm not going to make you a, a million promises here. I'm offering myself up as a guy with a certain amount of energy and I think good judgment. And if you think I have the right skills for the job, I'm prepared to serve. Steve, you wrote the book on Robarts. Uh, you're familiar with his accomplishments. So can you give us a lay of the land at the time? What was the context in which he now comes to power? And what are the types of things that he's got his eye on that he needs to accomplish to make Ontario a better place? Well, let's remember, this is the 1960s. These are the go-go 60s. Uh, Ontario is growing as never before. The revenues are flying in. They didn't have one unbalanced budget in the 1960s. The Robarts governments balanced their budgets. Um, and, and he spent, right? Like he, he took all that money that was coming in through all the economic growth in Ontario and they spent. They created the whole college system. Right? How many of people watching this right now went to George Brown or Humber or Seneca or wherever? I mean, we got 24 colleges in Ontario, and it was the Robarts government through the education minister, Bill Davis, who brought those in. Uh, OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. TVO, they created TVO. Uh, Bill Davis, again, education minister in the Robarts years. Go Transit. How many people watching this are commuters? They created Go Transit because they could see the increasing urbanization at the time and the need for people to commute. Uh, the first uh, anti-pollution laws came in around this time. Um, Mr. Robarts thought that children who weren't lucky enough to go to summer camp ought to have a place to play, so they created Ontario Place, a place where kids could hang out in the summertime. Um, he thought science ought to be fun, so they created the Ontario Science Centre at Don Mills and Eglinton in Toronto. That was a centennial year project. Um, I mean, we could go on and on. Do you, did, did you turn on the lights today? Do you know that that... Half the electricity generated in this province today comes from nuclear power. The Robarts government created the first ever nuclear generating stations in the province. It was at Pickering, just east of Toronto. That happened in the Robarts years. And perhaps one of the most important things, bombs were blowing up in mailboxes, Dan, in the province of Quebec. Right. And Robarts, who spoke no French, wanted to have a deep understanding of why that was happening. What does Quebec want? You know, we're sitting here in 2021, and people may be tired of that question, but back in the mid-1960s, people were not tired of it. They were actually quite fixated on it because they wanted to know why all this violence in Quebec, why this separatist movement. And so he put together something called the Confederation of Tomorrow Conference, which was on the top floor of the TD Center in November of 1967. He invited all the premiers to attend. He chaired it. He's the only premier in the country who could use his convening powers to bring all the premiers together um, and have a discussion about the future of the country. What does Quebec want? And they put it on television. And it was the first first minister's meeting since Charlottetown in 1867, 100 years earlier. That's why it was the Confederation of Tomorrow Conference. Uh, what's this country going to look like over the next 50 years? So, yeah, he was the premier of Ontario, but he was also, a, a, you know, a great Canadian who had his eye on the future of the country as well. Yeah, and that's something I think Londoners can be very proud of. His roots were here in London, and he took what he learned here, he took those skills, he took the family connections and went to that next level. But many have compared him, and I know there's an element of that in your book, comparing him to a Hemingway or a JFK, because there was almost a bit of a double life going on. And there was tragedy involved. Can you tell us about that sad part? Well, I mean, that's the title of my book, right? Public Triumph, Private Tragedy, The Double Life of John P. Robarts. Yeah, he had a brilliant prime ministership. And I say prime ministership because that's actually technically what the job was called then. It was prime minister of Ontario. Bill Davis changed it to premier. So he had a brilliant prime ministership. Uh, but his private life was something else. His private life was punctuated... Um, well, I just have to say it, out and out by tragedy. Uh, his son, Timothy, he had two adopted children. His son, Timothy, 
uh, was lost to suicide, got involved in drugs, and Timothy died at, uh, I think, age 21 or something, wrote a very long suicide note in which he said, I'm not blaming anybody, but I just think 21 is all the years I was meant to have on this planet. And I mean, you can imagine how that took the life out of Robarts. I mean, it just uh, completely took the wind out of his sails. Uh, his, his marriage, his first marriage to Nora McCormick, as she was born, uh, a, a woman he met at uh, Western University in London, uh, did not survive uh, the end of his political career. He begged her to move to Toronto so the family could be all together. Uh, she did not want to. She wanted to raise the children in London. They grew apart. They ended up divorcing. Nora had a terrible, untimely death. Uh, she choked on a piece of meat that she was eating from a TV dinner as she was alone in her home. Uh, she also indulged far too much in alcohol and she choked to death. And that was how her life came to an end. And then Robarts himself uh, had a stroke when he was about 64 years old. I'm thinking now this is probably 1981. He had a stroke and all the things that he loved to do in life, the hunting, the fishing, the socializing, he'd remarried to a woman 28 years his junior. He had a wonderful uh, romantic relationship with her. Um, none of those things were possible after his stroke. Half his body just stopped working. And he wow. told his daughter, Robin, she told me this story. He said, I'm going to give myself a year to recover from this stroke, but if I can't, I'm not going to live like this. And they both knew what he meant. And so I believe it was October 18th, 1982. He went into the shower stall of his home in Rosedale in Toronto and took with him the shotgun the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario bought for him as a thank you gift because he did like to hunt and he swallowed his gun. And that's how his life came to an end. 65 years old, October 18th, 1982. And I, I'm, I remember asking Robin once, Robin, your life just seems so tragic. And, and she herself died of cancer in her 50s. Like all four of them came to premature, tragic ends. But her answer was really inspiring, actually. She said, you know what? I've had a great life, punctuated by moments of tragedy, but a great life. Um, that's the double life for John Robarts. And they've often said, I know it sounds trite to say it, but they say law and politics can be a very jealous mistress. I think sometimes we take it for granted. We see our political leaders on television and uh, we forget the huge uh, sacrifices that they make for our benefit on, in many ways. And uh, it's sad to hear what you've just told us. And uh, I think many people who aren't familiar with the story might be surprised to hear that. Well, what's the legacy of John Robarts? Obviously, he moved the province forward in so many tremendous positive ways. And really, again, although it's been considered a conservative place to live, it's been a great place to live for so many for decades. What do you think his overall legacy is going to be, Steve? As Bill Davis often reminded me, uh, they were not conservatives. They were progressive conservatives. And there's a difference. And, you know, while they were fiscally conservative, they were socially moderate and progressive. They were pragmatic. They were not ideological. They were happy to take suggestions when they were good suggestions for members of the opposition. Uh, Bill Davis, I well remember, brought in rent controls in 1975, something he didn't want to do. Uh, but he did want to stay in power, and he realized that if to do that, uh, you'd have to put some water in your wine. And I think the Robarts legacy is, uh, is multifaceted. I, I mentioned some of his accomplishments earlier. I think of another one right now, the uh, Niagara Escarpment Commission. I mean, he, he was traveling from Niagara-on-the-Lake back to Toronto, looking at the beautiful Niagara Escarpment. He thought to himself, this escarpment, these are our crown jewels. we got to do something to protect this. And he put the wheels in motion, which eventually ended up being the Niagara Escarpment Commission, whose job it has been for 50 years now uh, to make sure that this United Nations internationally recognized biosphere of significance is well protected. Uh, I know we talk a lot about the Oak Ridges Moraine today, and it's good that that's being protected. But 50 years before they started protecting the Moraine, John Robarts had an eye on the Niagara Escarpment. So there are legislative achievements. There was a way of governing. There was a way he did business that was just 
it wasn't about the politics of personal destruction back then. It was about everybody getting elected to come to Queen's Park and do the people's business. And I think he had, better than most, an understanding that that didn't mean he and his party had a monopoly on a good idea. Of course they wanted to win. And of course they, you know, they raised money to, to help win. And, and he did win back-to-back -back majority governments in 63 and 67. And I think to this date, I think his 48.9% of the total votes cast in 1963 is still the record. I don't think anybody in post-war Ontario history has managed to achieve that high a percentage of the total vote. So I think that's still the, uh, the target everybody aims for. Yeah. Um, and of course, one of his best legacies was that um, there was a tremendous leadership convention to replace him. So he, he not only governed well during his decade there, but he put in place a number of potential successors so that when it was his time to leave, Ontario would continue to be well served by his successor. And that was Bill Davis, who ended up being the second longest serving premier in Ontario history. So, you know, we did okay by those guys, I have to say. They, we sure did. And in these hyper-partisan times, that's a message that I think it's all, it's good for all of us to hear and consider. Steve, we've got to wrap up. It's been really delightful having you here to talk about Premier John Robarts. Uh, it's, it's been very instructive. It's been informative. And as I say, there are lessons there, I think, for everyone, especially on the political stage. Uh, any books uh, that you're working on right now? Just quick before we wrap up. John Turner died uh, on September 19th, 2020. I'm writing his biography right now. Canada's wow. 17th Prime Minister. I look forward to reading that, Steve. And thanks for all your great work on this. It's important to talk about political history and you do it so well. So thanks for being here and uh, viewers come back again for London Lights. Our next episode's coming up soon.